Hello and welcome to the Sisters for Fitness Wellness Show. I'm Stephanie Gaines Bryant. Our guest today is Dr. Kwasi Sharif. He is a spine doctor. Mm -hmm. And today we're talking about keeping a healthy spine. Absolutely. Now, Dr. Sharif, I was telling you before we went on air that I'm a yoga instructor and one of the main health issues that women say they have when they come into my studio is, oh, my aching back. Mm -hmm. how they've had issues with sciatica or, or bulging discs, just different types of spine issues. Are you seeing more and more women nowadays presenting with spine issues? Absolutely. I think it's a combination of uh, 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 the trend of obesity because that definitely adds more influence within, you know, the pressure within your lower back. And then it's also uh, awareness. So uh, women nowadays are going to be more proactive when, when, when it comes to treating or, or, or looking into issues that pertain to their own body. So I think that's, it's, it's kind of a, a good thing and, uh, and it's, it, that's, it's actually overall a good thing. Um, just because if you do come see a spine specialist such as myself, uh, the earlier you see it, just like for preventive uh, care for diabetes or hypertension, the sooner we can uh, prevent worsening of your symptoms. Um, uh, one of the major issues I hear people talk about is sciatica, mm -hmm. which is dealing with the lower back. Correct. So sciatica is kind of kind of a misnomer. So what people are, tend to be really trying to say is that they have ridiculous pain uh, due to arthritis within their lower back or a disc herniation touching the uh, one of the nerves that are exiting out the lower part of their spine, typically the L5 or S1 nerve. So you have a spinal cord that, that drops down from your, your, uh, your brain all the way down to your lower back. And from that, from that column, your spinal cord, um, you have nerves that exit out the, the side. And when they exit, they exit out to do specific uh, duties, such as moving their legs or having sensation in your, in your legs. And that also works for the, the, the arms as well. So if you have any issues with the nerves as they exit out the side of uh, the spine as they exit out, you'll, you'll get the radiating pain, which is what people call sciatica. So how do you know where that pain is coming from? A lot of us self-diagnose. How do you <laughs> know for sure? You <laughs> 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 yes. Yeah. How do you know what that pain is that you're really experiencing back pain and that it's not something else? Yeah. So uh, for for our, for, for my st uh, standpoint, I spend a lot of time listening to patients. Uh, it's very important to understand, uh, you know, not just run to do tests or doing, uh, I mean, we're, I, I, uh, we're very good at doing physical exam maneuvers, things like that, but really understanding what the patient's actually saying. Uh, so uh, it's, uh, what I usually do is, uh, you know, listen, you know, ask very pertinent questions. If it's worse with sitting versus standing, if it's radiating versus axial, which is which means it's just down the the center of their body. All these questions help me or people in my field t uh, tweeze out where along uh, if it's radicular or if it's peripheral, um, such as diabetes or, or compression at, at a distal um, location within their nerves. Now you just mentioned two things that can be the cause of back pain. Mm -hmm. You mentioned obesity yes. is one of the things. Why would obesity be a big factor in sp in back pain? Yeah, so that's so obesity. Uh, what we know, we've done, we, we've um, stuck probes uh, in patient uh, in volunteers' uh, spine to see how much pressure is in their spine. So we know uh, we've placed patients on diets. There's been multiple studies that have shown this, placed patients on diets. And with a four, uh, four pound weight loss, there's 16 pounds of uh, decreased pressure within the lower spine. So you're saying that pressure on the spine with obesity causes? Yeah, so that's one thing. So if there's more pressure um, in the spine, you're going to be at increased risk of having a disc herniation or uh, um, uh, speeding up your arthritis uh, in your lower back. Uh, also, your center of gravity changes. So with, uh, with obesity, uh, your, your center of gravity is actually moved forward due to the anterior uh, mass of obesity uh, that one tends to gain. Uh, and when you do that, you throw off your whole dynamics of your spine, therefore increasing your, your chances of uh, having 
musculoskeletal issues within your, your, your lower back as well. And you're saying arthritis yes. plays a role. Osteoarthritis, correct. Mm -hmm. yeah. What does that do? Yeah, so osteoarthritis is just a simple way of saying the wear and tear. So as one gets older, it's almost inevitable you get some wear and tear, just like if you're, you know, you purchase a car, um, the way it looked when you drove off the lot is definitely a lot different than, let's say, you drive at 200,000 miles. You're going to get some wear and tear. Uh, and that's what osteoarthritis is, just a progressive wear and tear. Just some people, depending on what they do, um, you know, throughout their lifetime, like if they're more of a manual laborer, if they sit a lot, uh, you increase the wear and tear faster. Uh, weight increases the um, wear and tear faster, so you increase wear and tear. Or another way of saying, you increase your uh, osteoarthritis as you pr as you you age. And diabetes, how is that a factor? Yeah, so diabetes, uh, you uh, typically, uh, if it's type two, uh, it coincides with. Uh, weight gain, right? Uh, therefore, it increases the chance of having increase in uh, uh, osteoarthritis as well. Uh, also, um, diabetes will give you peripheral neuropathy. So not only do you have an increased chance of having the radicular or sciatic pain, but you'll also have distal extremity numbness, ting uh, tingling, things like that. Let's talk about the fact that we are moving toward non-interventional spine care, Absolutely. meaning less surgery. Absolutely. How, how is that happening? What's happening within the, the community where we're moving towards less surgery, which is a good thing. Of course we want less surgery. <laughs> yeah, of course. I, yeah, I, I, I absolutely agree. So uh, what we're, uh, what that, what non-interventional uh, spine care is, is, what we're really focused on, what I love to focus on, which is my passion, is really looking at the ergonomics of things. Uh, which we, I guess we can talk about. Uh, What's ergonomics? Oh, ergonomics is, is essentially how you interact with your environments. So let's say, um, you know, sit, you, if you go to work, you know, if you're using a laptop versus a desktop, th those are two different things. So uh, if you're using a desktop, that means you can separate the um, computer screen from the keyboard. So therefore, now I can adjust the keyboard based off of my, my shoulder height and then I can look straight and make sure my cervical neck isn't hyperflexed or hyperextended. So that's super important, right? As, a, as opposed to if you use a laptop, the computer screen is attached to the keyboard. So therefore, if you adjust the keyboard, the laptop, to up, uh, the appropriate level of your shoulders, your cervical neck will have to be flexed. So you're almost, you have to pick which one you want to make er ergonomically more successful for yourself. What's healthier? As far as... What's the healthiest oh, way? Oh, desktop. So desktop is, is by far... Um, by desktop, I mean having a computer... Because with technology nowadays, uh, I, I, I might as well just really... Because um, different technology, like there's, uh, there's the, uh, the iPad and all these things. So the most important thing is your, your computer screen should be separate from your whatever you're using to control the computer screen. Because the second that's not, you have to compromise one of the two. So it's very important to have the, the whatever you're using to type low, uh, you know, separate, and the, the monitor at eye level and looking straight. So, you know, so you don't, um, you know, wear down your shoulders, but at the same time, you don't uh, wear down your cervical neck. And is it healthier to stand? Absolutely, yeah. So standing is good to like the state, the the craze nowadays, which is completely appropriate. And I'm sure there's you know, people have seen so many different uh, commercials nowadays. Is the standing desk, which uh, uh, non-interventional spine physicians and physicians in general uh, highly recommend these things because we know if you stand, uh, the seated position is one of the worst positions uh, human beings can pretty much adapt. Uh, the, the chair is an invention. So before the chair, we didn't have the opportunity to sit for eight hours a day, nine hours, 10 hours, because if one thinks about it, uh, you don't just sit down for work. You're actually, when you go to drive to that job, you're sitting, uh, and then you get to work and then you're sitting, and then you go home and you, and you start watching TV, you're sitting. So if you actually add up all the hours you're sitting, it is significantly uh, increased versus your ancestors thousands of years ago. So that's, we're not adapted to sit, and therefore we increase our chances of having lower back pain. So then when you go to the gym, 
all of a sudden you want to you know, do a little exercise, you're going to be more prone to injuring yourself. Because you've been sitting. Because you've been sitting so long, uh, and it's very common. Now, one of the things I hear uh, when it comes to back pain is I want to exercise because I want to stretch out my back. Yeah. But when I exercise, it hurts. Mm -hmm. So it's a catch-22. It hurts to exercise, but I need to exercise. Yeah, and that's, a, that's, that's actually a little more difficult just because I, I get that, that all the time uh, in, my, in, my, uh, in my office. And uh, the question is, what are you actually doing? So everybody has been to the gym uh, and you know, looked over to the right or left and seen uh, someone doing a very awkward exercise that clearly doesn't look that beneficial to them. So for me, since I'm not in the gym, I can't tell you that what you just told me that you work out a lot and you're trying to help yourself, if you are that person that is doing something that's not the appropriate exercise. So that's why for me, I very much, I, I definitely like people taking a pro proactive uh, stance on their health, that's number one. But I prefer patients to go to physical therapy, have someone who's trained, who's done multiple years of training on how, or on your body function and how you should exercise. You know, do physical therapy, do a couple of sessions, and then kind of take that knowledge and translate that to working on working out in the gym. So almost have like a, you know, a license, you know, a, a highly, highly, highly licensed trainer um, to really help you, uh, you know, get yourself back to where you need to go. What are some of the other non-interventional, non-surgical ways you can keep yourself healthy? Yeah. So, uh, well, obviously there's there's exercise. Um, diet, weight loss, things like that. There's different modalities such as um, uh, heat packs, cryotherapy, which, which, which is essentially uh, cold packs, uh, ice, things like that. To which is better? That's, that's the, the $20 million question. Should you use heat or ice? Mm -hmm. Should you use both? What should you use when you first get that injury? What should you use on a regular basis? And it honestly depends on the patient or, or the person. So in general, he is uh, better for your muscles. Uh, cryotherapy or cold, cold packs, uh, that tends to slow down your uh, the, the nerves sending signals, right? So a lot of times if people have uh, back spasms, it could be possibly due to the nerve just almost short circuiting and sending signals too often to, your, to the muscle to tell it to contract and therefore the uh, patients view that as muscle spasms. So cold packs, just literally, they just slow down the signal and therefore you may get some spasming relief from cold packs. But in general, the long-winded answer, uh, the, or the, uh, just to clarify that, uh, it depends on the patient. I recommend patients trialing both. Uh, there's really no harm in doing so. I just would not recommend someone uh, using a, a heat or a, heat, a heating pack overnight, you definitely don't just go to sleep with that because you could have increased uh, chance of uh, having superficial burns. What about if you've got, I want to make sure we hit the disc issue mm -hmm. because of I hear a got. lot of people talk about they have a bulging disc. Everybody talks about bulging. <laughs> what does that mean? Yeah, so yeah, uh, it just means that uh, the, the disc that are, that's in your spine, um, that's literally bone, disc, bone, disc to provide cushion, uh, herniates or bulges out and it touches the nerve. Uh, sometimes people can, so if I did an MRI on everybody in society, uh, at a certain age or a certain time period, a lot of people will have a disc bulge. So a, having a disc bulge doesn't mean that that's the problem. Um, it's common. The body is actually able to reabsorb a disc. So you can have a disc in one moment and you know over time it gets reabsorbed. So the question is, does that disc bulge that herniates out the, your, um, your, your spine, uh, if it pushes against the nerve, you get the shooting pain, that's going to be more of something, you know, we should focus on. So what, what can you do? Mm -hmm. What's the, what's the solution? Yes. Not without having surgery. Gotcha. So solution, uh, prevention, which is what we kind of already, um, touched on. Uh, another thing would be physical therapy, right? So if, uh, the disc herniation, if it's on the, um, the neural foramenal side, which means that, uh, the portion of your of your spine where the nerves are exiting, if if the disc is 
is interacting with your nerve there. Uh, most likely you have pain when you go to sit, right? That's very common when the patients can't really sit. When they sit, they get the shooting pain, so then they have to stand up again. So what I like to do is I like to do a physical therapy uh, protocol called McKenzie phys Physical Therapy. Uh, it, that was uh, made popular around like 30 years ago. It's a, it's a physical therapist from New Zealand. Uh, and the premise is that doing repetitive uh, physical therapy and uh, uh, strengthening, stretching, stretching, and relief modifying position. So if sitting, this, uh, this flexion motion that we're doing, if that's what's causing you pain, then we do a lot of extension. So you, uh, you, sh you I, I'm sitting right now, but you wouldn't sit. You would go into extension and kind of rock back and forth and do stretching in that position. So relief modifying positions and vice versa. So if standing causes you more pain, then you would do more of a flexion uh, base uh, therapy. So you do what's the opposite? Yeah, yeah. There's multiple trains of thought when it, uh, when it comes to this, but that um, the McKenzie physical therapy is what uh, a lot of research that I've seen tends to favor. Do you ever recommend yoga? Yes. For yes, absolutely, absolutely. Once again, the one caveat behind yoga is. Everybody does yoga differently. Exactly. So. <laughs> Everybody um, teaches differently. Um, and sometimes the postures are not being done correctly. Exactly. So if I, if I tell a patient to automatically go do yoga and, you know, they're doing some, something, you know, that no. Because they're different types. Yeah. And then they come back, they'll come back to me saying, why did you tell me to do yoga? It's way worse. That's one of the reasons why I don't tell them to jump to that. Uh, Yoga is definitely good for you, but I ha you have to really understand like who's the trainer and is, is or not trainer or who's instructing the class and is that person really looking at what you're doing? Because if they're not and you're in one, you know a large class, you know it's, it's the New Year, so everybody may be jumping into it. Yes. The class is now 100 people, and you could be doing something that no one, you know, who does a lot of yoga would allow you to do. Uh, that's one thing I, I, you know, I really wouldn't want people to jump into. You know. Let's talk, we talk a lot in yoga when I was in training about compression of the spine. Mm -hmm. um, as a matter of fact, my oldest brother had a situation where he had compression on the spine. He was paralyzed for a couple of months. Mm -hmm. And how that compression can really, it can really be debilitating. Absolutely. Can yeah. we talk a little bit about that? So, I would have to get a little more information about what, that means? Well, what happened is he has arthritis. Mm -hmm. And it, I guess the inflammation from the arthritis started pressing against the wrong nerves. Mm -hmm. And next thing we knew, and it happened very suddenly, and he's had, he had childhood arthritis, mm -hmm. which is very rare. Very rare. Um, so but as he uh, became an adult, it started bothering him again once he got into his 50s. Gotcha. And uh, next thing we know, this thing is happening. Gotcha. to him. So um, long story short, he went through a lot of physical therapy. He's doing much better now, will always have a slight limp. Mm -hmm. But that goes to show you how you have to really pay attention to the health of yeah. the spine. Uh, yeah, absolutely. Yeah. So uh, was he, you said he was, par was he paralyzed? Yeah, for a couple of months. He had to oh. like learn to walk again, wow. learn to talk again, learn to feed himself again. I mean, he had to go through the whole nine um, yards to, to, to gain his health back. Yeah, so uh, we've just been talking about uh, uh, how the nerves are impact when they exit the spine and they give you that sciatic or ridiculous pain shooting down your legs or your arms. So in that case, and once again, I'm, you know, I'm not his physician, so I don't know the, the details of his care, but uh, that lets me know it's more of a spinal cord injury. So instead of where the nerves are exiting, it's most likely where the spinal cord is going up and down. And there may be some uh, arthritis that's been building up since he was a child that interact with the nerves as they uh, you know, descend and ascend up and down the spinal cord. So, And we've seen, too, a lot with uh, people coming back from um, um, war injuries. Mm -hmm. We've seen now where they can do a lot more spinal cord with people with spinal cord injuries than they were able to do 50 years ago during the Vietnam War. Yeah, technology has improved a lot. Uh, for, especially for spinal cord injury uh, patients. Uh, there's still a lot to do, uh, to, to be quite honest. I know there's a lot of area when it comes to stem cell uh, research, things like that. But, uh, that's still getting figured out at this point. Um, 
And you know what was interesting is earlier in the program you mentioned the whole ergonomics mm -hmm. thing. So should we get up and walk a couple of times a day if it's not possible in your office to stand up all day? If it's just not, you know, you're not in the kind of office where you can do that, should you g get up two or three times a day from your office, from your desk? And what, because I know um, when I'm at my other job mm -hmm. at WG, I'm sitting. Yeah, you're always typing the news. <laughs> yeah for three hours before I go on air. And then when I go on air, I could stand up, but I don't. Yeah, we're, we're sitting <laughs> down right now. We, don't, we could be standing up for this interview, yeah, exactly. but we're not going. <laughs> exactly. What is the healthiest thing to do? Should you get up a couple of times? Absolutely. 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 And it, it's not our fault. Uh, we, are, we are designed to conserve energy. And sitting is an energy uh, conservative position. Our muscles are more relaxed and our brain says, oh, we're, we're doing good. But at the end of the day, we just we should not be doing this position. So a lot, a lot of way, a lot of ways people get away with um, try to combat this. One, one, the standing desk, that's one, obviously. Uh, and then also having one of the, um, like the Fitbits or... Yes. Oh, you have <laughs> <laughs> That alarms you and then you realize, oh, I've been sitting down. I don't know what your timer's for, but I've been sitting down for 30 minutes or I need to get up. Yeah, you just need to get up. And you don't have to do anything too ridiculous. You could uh, just get up and uh, go into extension. So you've been in this, this flex position, so do the opposite. So kind of extend and kind of you know rock back and forth, do one of those motions, um, and do it every 30 minutes. And, and it's hard at first, obviously, if you haven't been accustomed to doing so. But if you, you know, stick in there and do it for a couple of months, people get people are almost addicted to making sure they get some steps in and getting their exercise in. So it becomes it a... It is addictive. It really is. This little thing, yeah. this why it's, it's it like you got honest. me. <laughs> it keeps you honest. You can't ignore it. <laughs> what, do you, what do you tell athletes who, who are middle-aged like me and after a while, after all those years of pounding it out, you start having back issues? Can you continue your lifestyle? Is there a healthy things you can do that can cause can help you continue on with that healthy lifestyle with that athletic lifestyle yeah one never stop <laughs> the problem is when a lot of times when people stop uh, uh and they try to go do the exact same thing they they remember themselves doing that's when a lot of injury occurs you know because you, you wouldn't do that for anything in life you don't just jump back doing what you exactly what you're doing so the key is to kind of go up gradually right uh so I find that to be a huge thing, but it's the same thing for uh, not even just athletes, for anyone in society. Just make sure you stay active, um, continue to exercise, do things like yoga classes, things like that. Uh, and that's, that's honestly the best thing to do. Should you mix it up? As far as? Not doing the same motion yeah. all the time? Yeah, the, um, uh, muscle confusion, is, uh, it's well studied. If you keep, do, if you keep telling your muscles you know, the same thing, they're gonna get really, efficient at doing that one job and you won't see any changes but if you keep changing it up confusing the muscle uh, that clearly will give you the most benefit how are we moving where are we moving in the future when it comes to um, um, dealing with healthy backs it appears that we are moving towards more not having as much surgery mm -hmm. what are some of the other things that we're moving toward yeah so there's a lot of uh one the huge ergonomic push because companies are really noticing that if i invest some money into getting patients uh patients and employees standing they won't have as much back pain in the future and, uh, and therefore there's there's money saved there's money uh, uh there's, a, there's money saved as far as uh, people having off from work, disability, all these things are factors in the company's bottom line. So ergonomics is like massive. Uh, and you're gonna start seeing more and more commercials talking about ergonomics and things you can do. And sometimes people, uh, now jobs are telling, uh, are, are, are making sure, pay, uh, they're, I guess they're charging less for medical insurance if you if they can record how much you're walking so they're like now invested in your own health before they really weren't doing that but now they're noticing if we just invest in the front end we actually may save money and they know they're probably going to save money in the back end so that's 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 huge right there uh, and then also there's different injections uh, so there's like PRP uh, things like that that are coming how do up. they work 
Yeah, so the study, studies are still out uh, for, uh, for those type of injections. And, uh, so basically, they, the whole goal is to, for a lot of these different modalities or injections that they do, um, not including steroid injections, which we already do, but other things, uh, ha allow your own body to essentially heal itself. And that's the overall gist of that. Are there some holistic things that people can do as far as maybe some vitamins? You know the vitamins, they have, um, uh, the <coughs> glucochondroitin or whatever. Yeah, there's so many, yeah. <laughs> yeah, are, are, there, are those really worth it? Are those any good? Or those just kind of <laughs> wasting my money? Or <laughs> yeah, it's a- Glucosamine. Glu yeah, yes, glucosamine. <laughs> yes. I mean, it's a, I, I mean that's, it's billion dollar industry right there, only getting larger. Uh, the only problem is the studies that you do, and it's so, I mean, holistic is like the largest umbrella, and the umbrella is getting larger, because there's, people are noticing there's so much money being made in doing this, so uh, a lot of the studies for, and once again, there's a bunch of stuff, uh, things you could, you could consider holistic. If you do studies, they don't show that it, uh, they, they work that much. Okay. Yeah. And a lot of the holistic medications, uh, they don't really have to prove that it works. They mostly need to prove that it doesn't harm you. And then therefore they could just kind of throw it, you know, put it out there uh, in our society. But uh, I don't, so, so I don't, re I don't uh, refrain patients from using holistic medication. I just want to make sure that they don't use anything that hurt, like hurts them. Is there any validity to, um and we'll talk about this because I'm definitely going to have you back. Um, is there any validity to the copper, using the copper uh, products for your knees or copper products for your back that's supposed to, something about the copper? Yeah. The, I, <laughs> okay, so, I guess the answer is no. Well, yeah. It's, <laughs> so, I mean, I, 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 so I'm not going to speak about the knee because I'm the spine. So yes. So I'm sure there's going to be someone else talking about that. But for uh, back racing in general, not copper. So I'm not speaking about copper because that I don't see any specific studies when it comes to that. But for back racing in general, people, you know, 20, 30 years ago, people would always wear the back racing yes. and stuff like that. But what we found out uh, with research and time, because uh, now those people are now old enough and now we see what's happened. So essentially we know that wearing a back brace for a prolonged period of time actually makes you worse. So what happens is if you brace any structure, in this case, we're talking about your spine, right? So you can move and not have pain. If you brace any structure in society or in life, uh, that structure that you braced did not get stronger. Okay. You've only weakened that structure. So we know that uh, for, a long, um, for a long period of time, uh, you should only use back braces for acute flare-ups, things like that. We're going to have to wrap it up, but it's been great. We've been talking to Dr. Kwasi Sharif, and he's a spine doctor, and we've been talking about non-interventional spine techniques or things you can do to maintain a healthy spine. Absolutely. I'm Stephanie Gaines Bryant. You've been watching the Sisters for Fitness Wellness Show. Have a great day.